What is your primary representational system? Keep watching. This is Life Mastery Gym. I'm Damon Card, and I teach people just like you cutting edge NLP processes and techniques so that you can master your life and take charge of your destiny. So if that sounds good, make sure you click that subscribe button right down here so you can get these videos on a regular basis. What are representational systems in NLP? If you already know, let me know in the comments section down below. And of course, as you watch this video to the very end, if you have any questions or you have other comments, please let me know in the comment section below. I will respond to you. Representational systems are basically your five senses. They're more than just your five senses, and I'll get into that in a moment. But first, let's think of representational systems as your five senses, your ability to see, to hear, to touch, and also to smell and taste. Now, we don't get too much into the smell and taste in NLP. And there's good reason because we don't normally try to solve problems using our sense of smell and our sense of taste unless you are a sommelier, uh, maybe you're a professional wine judge, or you're a chef. If you don't fall into those categories or categories similar to that, we're, you probably don't really use your sense of smell or taste to solve problems. And if you do, Everything pretty much that I say here in this video, you can apply to that as well. But in this video, we're gonna focus on visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Now, in NLP, we say the map is not the territory. And we say that we don't, we don't interact with reality directly, or we don't respond to reality directly. We respond from an internal map. So we take in information through our five senses, and we represent or represent internally a map of the world around us. Now we take in way too much information to be able to process it all. So through distortion, deletion, and generalization, we create an internal representation. And like a map, which is not, doesn't have every single detail of the territory, it only has the necessary details in order to navigate the, the territory, which makes a map useful. That's how we go about doing this, the same exact thing. We represent that, we have that internal map inside of us. Now, how do we represent that map? We represent it through sensory-based information. And that's why NLP, we go into structure, not necessarily content. So what is the structure of your map? Is it primarily visual? Is it primarily kinesthetic, touch, and, and proprioception? Or is it primarily auditory? Now, I see this so often, and I'm guilty of this too. When I, when I first started studying NLP, we start learning about representational systems, and we, we go, well, Oh, I think I'm all. I think I'm visual. I see. I see lots of images, so I think I'm visual. And then somebody might say, "Well, I really like music, and I really like sounds. And sounds that are lo too loud or distorted really bother me. So maybe I'm auditory." And then some people say, "Well, I feel everything. I, I feel everything before I make a choice, before I make a decision. So I think I'm kinesthetic." And then also we go looking to other people and we try to figure them out. We look at them and we go. I mean, we talk to them for a little bit and we say, hmm, I think this person's really visual. Well, there's a big problem with all of that. The truth is, is that first of all, everybody uses every representational system. I get people telling me all the time, Damon, I'm not visual. I can't visualize. And I say, okay, look, I understand. Maybe you are not conscious of what your vision, your visualizations are, but I assure you, you do visualize. And the same for any other representational system. I've worked with somebody who was blind and he had visuals and he could describe them to me. So we use all of the representational systems. As much as we like to sort of corner ourselves and say, hmm, this is who I am, or we like to sort of corner other people and say, this is who they are, it's really not useful and it, it's not even true. So if you're doing that, I would say, let that go. The truth is, is that we use all of the representational systems to create our internal map. And we may, we might well have one that we really, or what we would call primary. We tend to lean on that representational system more than others. But again, oftentimes it's very contextual. And I'll give you an example. So an athlete, if the athlete is trying to solve a problem doing the sport that they do, a lot of times they're going to be kinesthetic, proprioceptive. That's where they solve the problem, but not always. Even though it's very physical, whatever it is that they're doing, they might also use visual to know where they're, where they're going or what they're doing. 
a person, a, a, a basketball athlete, has to see where they're shooting. They have to be very well aware of where everyone is around them. Now, it's very physical, so they probably have to know in their body uh, where they are in time and space when they shoot a basket. They probably know if that ball's going to go in before it even leaves their hands because they know the way that their body is supposed to feel, the proper alignment. And at the same time, they're also listening. They can't see behind them, but they can hear and they can listen. They can hear maybe somebody walking up or running up behind them trying to take the ball. So the truth is, is that we use all of these representational systems. We use them also uh, oftentimes simultaneously. Yes, it's true. We tend to lean on one, just like we tend to lean on one hand. One hand is stronger than the other, but that doesn't mean we don't use the other hand. I'm right-handed, but I use my left hand for a lot of things. The same thing goes for representational systems. You use all of your representational systems. So if you're a new NLP student, or even if you've been studying NLP for a while and you're still trying to like figure this out, relax. This is, it's not about figuring anything out. When we use our calibration and our sensory acuity skills, yes, we want to gather the information. We want to have a sense of how this person who we're working with or who we're trying to influence, how they process reality. And chances are, just like most people, they will have a primary representational system, one representational system that they tend to uh, process everything through. But the other part about this that's almost always true is they're using all of their representational systems that, that guides them, that helps them solve problems. And it's when we cut out or when we don't pay attention to our other representational systems that we often feel stuck because we don't have enough information to know how to solve the problem. I'll give you an example of how you can understand representational systems for better communication. So if a person is speaking very fast, and especially if they're looking straight ahead or they're looking up a lot, they're tending to visualize. They're looking at movies and that's how, that's what's informing the words that they say. Kinesthetic people, very kinesthetic people, often look down into their right. They're processing their feelings. It's not always to the right, just in general, if they look down, the tendency is, is like they're, they're passing the information through their body to know what to say or how to go forward. And they tend to breathe very deeply. And you'll notice that if you get in touch with your feelings, you will tend to breathe more deeply. Whereas a very visual person tends to look up more. They breathe very shallow, shallowly because they're, they're talking very fast. They're trying to keep up with their images. They're trying to keep up with the movies. But a kinesthetic person is breathing deeply, looking down, and they tend to talk very slow. So if you, if you, if a person is being very kinesthetic, doesn't mean that they're always kinesthetic. Maybe in this particular context, they're very kinesthetic and they're talking to someone who's very visual and that very visual person is talking very fast because they're trying to keep up with their images. That's going to annoy the person who's very kinesthetic. They're going to, they're going to want that person to slow down because they can't keep up with it. They can't pass the feelings through their body fast enough. If someone is talking very fast. Now, if you switch it around a person who's very kinesthetic, breathe deeply and they talk like this, like I went down to the park and I had all these feelings. <laughs> and so if you're very kinesthetic, you might be like, yeah, <laughs> if you're very visual, you might be like, come on, would you, you know, would you spit it out? Would you say everything? So these two types of people are these two types of communicators. And again, it's usually context specific just because you're visual in one context doesn't mean you're gonna be visual in every context. And the same thing with kinesthetic, you will tend to annoy each other. And so when you understand that about the person, and I used to do this in sales all the time, I'd sell insurance and I would try to figure out, okay, how, how is this person processing the information that I'm giving them? Now, if they talk, if they look down a lot to their right, I know they're checking their feelings. If they look down to their left, they they're typically talking to themselves and they're going back and forth. And I've seen this a lot. So I would do that. I would mirror that. I would, I would look down, I'd go into my feelings. I would talk to myself and then I would talk rather slowly to the person so they could manage the information that I was giving them. Now it would be very different if the person was very visual. I would say things like imagine or picture this, you know, visualize this. And I would try to talk at a pretty steady pace so they wouldn't get bored. If you talk very slowly to a person who's using the visual representational system primarily, they're, you're basically putting their movies in slow motion and they're getting bored really fast. I found the auditory types, they don't tend to get bothered too much by speaking fast or speaking slow. 
if you speak very high, in a high pitch way, they tend to, to get, want to get away from you. They don't, they don't like that at all because they like more resonant uh, sounds. And so if you're talking to a person who's very uh, auditory or very auditory in the moment, uh, they tend to pull their, their arms back, almost like they're trying to clear the way for their ears, and they'll tend to cock their head to the side a little bit like this. So you want to talk very melodically. You want to talk very smoothly, very resonant. And you'll say, well, how does that sound to you? You know, So words like that really, really work well with them, for them. Now, it's important, too, that I talk about kinesthetic because this is a, there's a myth that is, it goes around in NLP, and people think that they're very kinesthetic. And I hear people say, oh, I'm so kinesthetic. And I say, well, what lets you know that you're kinesthetic? And they'll say, oh, I have to feel things. I have to feel something before I make any decision. I have to really feel it. I have to feel it, you know, like, and they'll often do like this, or they'll point to their, their chest, their solar plexus, or their stomach. Everybody in that regard is kinesthetic. What you're t when you're referring to that, what you're talking about is an emotional evaluative kinesthetic. All of us or emotional evaluative kinesthetic. That's how we make any decision. We may take in information visually, we may take in information auditorily, and we may take in information through touch or proprioception. That information goes in, and it could also be we're checking in with the representations that we make of the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic inside of us. That would be the checking in with my feelings. That would be talking to myself. That would be checking my pictures, my movies. That might be hearing another voice, uh, not my own, but someone else, you know, like another voice, like a parental voice or a critical voice. And I'm checking all of these things. And after a while of taking in and processing that information, I get a feeling, I get an emotion, I get an evaluation. And that's when I make a choice. That's how it works for everybody. So in that regard, everybody is kinesthetic. People who are truly kinesthetic, we're talking actual tactile touch and we're talking proprioception. So you have, we, it's important to split these two in the kinesthetic and understand that everybody's kinesthetic in the emotional and evaluative way. But not everybody's very kinesthetic when it comes to touch and when it comes to proprioception. So there are two different things. Now, there are some traits of different people uh, with different rep who have different primary representational systems. Very visual people will tend to be slender. They will tend to pay more attention to their appearance. Not a big surprise there. Uh, auditory people will tend to gravitate toward music. They will tend to have very resonant voices, like they actually pay attention to how their voice sounds. And they will, of course, tend to gravitate toward pleasant sounds, melodic sounds, people with resonant voices. And then very kinesthetic people. Very kinesthetic people will tend to be a little more overweight. They're not as concerned about their appearance, but they like the way usually food tastes. Um, they might even like the feeling of having a little extra uh, weight, a little extra body. Uh, they will tend to breathe deeply and they will tend to look down a lot as they're processing this information. Now, these extremes do exist. You might have a person who's like very, very kinesthetic. You might have a person who's very auditory. You might have a person who's very visual. But in general, I've found in my experience that most people are quite balanced. They're not completely balanced, but they're, they're pretty well balanced. It's like if you're right-handed, you don't only use your right hand. You're going to use your left hand too. You might not use it as much but you're gonna use your left hand maybe 30 or 40% of the time, whereas your right hand is gonna be 50 or 60% of the time. It works very much the same way with representational systems. Now, if you are one of those extremes, if you are extremely visual or extremely auditory, or extremely kinesthetic, that's not necessarily a good thing. You wanna balance this out a little bit more. You wanna get familiar with being able to take in information through different representational systems and also adding that to your internal representational system because you will find more resources and more solutions, especially when you're trying to solve problems. So overall, the main point about understanding representational systems in NLP is first of all, to understand yourself better, understand how you represent reality better, and are you putting too much emphasis on one primary, on, on one representational system? And if so, maybe it's a good idea to start developing your other senses. If you feel like you don't visualize very well, I would recommend you work on that because visualization or using the visual representational system is probably the most powerful one. And the reason for that is you can access so much more information simultaneously through visuals. So think about this, you can see a painting and immediately you access several colors all at once. But if you were going through the auditory and you heard multiple voices all at once, you can't, I mean, I, I don't even think I can pay attention to more than one. Maybe if you're musically trained or you have a very sensitive 
auditory representational system. You can maybe manage to hear two voices, maybe three at the same time and understand them or hearing multiple musical instruments at one time. Like I can't pick them out. I can, if there's one playing, I can pick that out. If two playing, I can maybe bounce back and forth and, 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 and capture that information. If there's three or four or five, like an orchestra, I have no idea what musical instruments are being played. So it kind of just all merges together, but visual is different. You can access a lot of that information simultaneously and distinctly and know what it is. And then of course, with feelings, you have a feeling in the body or you have a touch and you have touches in multiple places of your body. It's hard to process all of that information all at once, unlike in the visual representational system. All, represent all representational systems are important, but some are going to be stronger than others, which is why you want to balance them out more. Also, understanding representational systems and how they work is amazing for communication because you can recognize someone. And like I said, we don't want to judge or we don't want to try to back someone into a corner or pinpoint them and say, you're visual or you're auditory. It's, it's not really useful to do that. But what you can recognize is in a particular context or a particular subject that maybe you're speaking to this person about, you start to realize how they're processing this information. So one way that you can gain rapport with them very quickly is to align with their representational system. And like I said, if they're very kinesthetic, slow down your speech, breathe more deeply. They will appreciate that. If they're very visual, speak a little faster, speak in visual terms. And again, they will feel like you know them. They will feel like you are very familiar to them. So you'll gain rapport very quickly. And then you can lead from that point on. You can be very influence, influential and persuasive when you're using their representational systems to communicate to them. It just feels a lot more clear to them, a lot more understandable. It just gets easier for them. And if it's easy for them and it's familiar, they're more likely to go along with what it is you're wanting to persuade them or influence them to do. If you'd like to know more about what I do and what I teach, if you're looking for coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching, I do that. And if you want more information on that, go to the description right here down below. There will be a link there. And then if you're not so much interested in the one-on-one -on -one coaching, but you're more interested in learning, there's also a link down there as well. Click that link and you will get more information about how to learn more and take what I teach here in my videos much, much deeper. If you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, make sure you click that subscribe button and click the bell so you'll be notified when I put new videos out. Last but not least, if you can think of a family member or a friend who you think would benefit from this video, make sure you share it with them. Take care.